So this morning we're talking about overcoming darkness, and we're in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, if you have your Bibles, or you can go to your Bible app uh, on your phone, and we will, we will just dive right in, starting with verse 1. It says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want to read that a little more, one more time because as we go through this passage, verse 1 through 14, the entirety of this passage needs to be looked at through the filter of verse 1 and 2. This is, this is where the Apostle Paul sets the precedent for the entire passage. Let's read it one more time. He says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And in your bulletin, you can mark this down. It says, to fully love, we must know, we must know that we are dearly loved. To fully love, we must know that we are dearly loved. John, the apostle, said, we love because he first loved us. So to fully love, we need to first realize that we are dearly loved by God. That is, that the source of our ability to walk in the way of love Paul puts an emphasis on we are dearly loved children. And so we can walk around trying to meet this standard of loving our neighbor as ourselves, as the Jews did for thousands of years, following it as a rule, as a command, as some kind of an obligation. And then we can find the same results that they did, in which they found out they didn't have it within themselves to get. But Jesus came with this radical message of God loves you. That it begins with God's love for you and then extends from there into your love for the world. And so often we get caught into the religious trap. We get caught into keeping the rules and regulations and then we find ourselves running dry. We find ourselves thinking that we're shining a light, but really we're just shining legalism. We're putting legalism on display, and we're showing that there's no distinction between our beliefs and any other religious belief. Because any religious system of the world is based on man just trying to earn his way to God. But this is the radical difference of the gospel, is that it shows that God has already paid the price necessary for you to be in relationship with him. So you don't have to earn anything. Jesus lived a perfect life on your behalf. He paid the price for your sin on the cross in your place. He rose from the dead to authenticate the reality of his ministry and his sacrificial atoning death. And that he was who he said he was. And then he said, wait in Jerusalem to the apostles. He ascended to the right hand of God. He sent the Holy Spirit to deliver God's love into our hearts, Romans chapter 5 says. And then out of the Holy Spirit being delivered, Delivering God's love to our hearts, we then deliver his love to others. So this is where Paul begins as he gets ready to go into a list of things that represent darkness. And then he calls the Christians to walk in light. He wants you to first understand what light looks like in a realistic perspective, in a practical reality. Light looks like love. But I think the church often defines the concept of shining your light as what we saw on the Christian Uber commercial. Right? Where I gotta listen to Caleb, I gotta do all the things that look Christian, I gotta learn to speak Christianese. Hey brother, how you doing today? You know, we gotta learn all the lingo. Oh God bless you. I love the one that uh, John Chris does on 17 ways to say no in a Christian manner. You know, he's like, well, the Lord's just not leading me in that direction right now. I'm just not feeling it in my spirit. You know, we've got all this Christian lingo that we use, 
right? And Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But here's the thing. Shining your light does not mean starting an uber Christian service. It means learning to walk in the way of love. And then the Apostle Paul shows us what the way of love is. He gives us a picture. And I love how Paul used visual uh, uh, language to try to give us something that we're supposed to aim for. He says, walk in the way of love. And then he paints this picture of Christ giving himself up for us as a fragrant offering. He not only you know, puts this picture of Jesus dying on the cross, but then he shows how God viewed that action. Because they were viewing it from a worldly standpoint. They looked at Jesus as a cursed heretic who was claiming to be God as a man and he was violating everything they believed. And so they saw him as deserving of the cross, but God from heaven saw it as a fragrant offering of atonement, a payment for sin. We walk in the way of love by being able to learn to be sacrificial as Christ was. To begin to lay down our life for others. Uh, Amanda and I and, and the Chino were having a conversation this weekend because she's been staying with us through the weekend. We were talking about how sometimes in, in, in marriage, uh, you know, women will marry a man who's very uh, kind of uh, like a dictator in a way. He's often uh, quoting the scripture, wives, you need to submit to your husband. And using that almost as like a tool to put her down. That's not walking in the way of love. Because right afterwards, we are to love our wives and lay down our life for her as Christ loves the church. So you tell me who has the stronger command from God, the husband or the wife. Think about that. He uses one quick sentence for the wife. Hey, wife, submit to the husband. Then he uses this real long one for the husband. He says, lay down your life as Christ laid down his life for the church. And then he just he really makes sure that he understands who has the higher responsibility in the relationship. But it's not just the marriage. It's with this concept of walking in the way of love, learning to be children of light as Paul gets into and oftentimes we take the passage that I'm getting ready to run into, and that's why I'm taking a few moments on this first two verses to make sure we get into the right vein before we just run through the rest of the passage. Because this passage is not about Paul coming to sinners with a club and beating them up for their sins. This passage is about him speaking to a group of Christians that were not learning to walk in love Showing them, first, it's about love. Second, it's about holiness, which leads to the proper display of God's life. Amen? So let's continue. I want you to write this down. That you're writing down in your bulletin. It says, without the filter of love, light can cause harm. Without the filter of love, light can cause harm. So, Light exposes the darkness, right? So, let's say I have a friend that's doing something that's wrong. I can just straight up spread light. I can say, you're wrong, it's horrible, it's sinful, you should never do that again. How receptive is that person going to be? Today? I want you to think of the lens or the, the, the filter of love like sunglasses or maybe some sunscreen. Right? Light is great because it helps me see what's in front of me. It also provides nourishment for plant life. And, I mean, without the sun, obviously, no one can survive. However, without a filter, it can also give me skin cancer, right? It can cause harm. And so sometimes we're so quick to just shine light, to, to expose darkness, but we do it in the wrong spirit. And so what I'm talking about this morning is an uncompromised church in which we live in a day in which, in which uh, uh, abortion is becoming something that is now, you know, celebrated. We live in a day in which marriage between a man and a woman is looked at as old school and no longer applicable. We're living in a day where darkness is increasing. 
and the church is becoming reactive. And so as soon as we hear something that goes against our beliefs, we just react. And we just say, no, that's wrong. No, and, and, and although we're speaking the truth, we're not using love to convey that truth. So are we standing in a season, in a time, in a generation in which truth needs to be spoken and the church needs to be uncompromised? Absolutely. But how do we do that in a way that's effective that brings about truth? It's not by sharing every news article that you see on Facebook because you know that your friends are going to read it and then they're going to change their political opinion. Come on. Sometimes we, we, I see these Facebook crusaders and they, they think if they share a CNN or a Fox News article, all their friends are just going to become believers in their political viewpoint. That's not the strategy. How about if they see you walking in the way of love, they see you living a life that is set apart, they see you demonstrating what it means to be children of light. Then they're curious about what you believe about certain issues. And then you're able to minister to them. You're able to draw them in and say, here's why I believe that we need to be pro-life. Here's why I believe that we need to create a culture of valuing human life. Rather than, hey, we need to just pass a law and the law is just going to solve the problem. Because that's how oftentimes we're viewed. As just wanting to use the legislator to impose our religious beliefs on people. And then people don't want to hear what we have to say. Rather than they just see that we truly care about unborn children. We truly care about having stable families with a mother and a father. And we, we believe in the value. And we got to start with, with, with stopping having so many divorces in the church because we're not really doing a good job of creating stable families either, by the way. So what if we started living this thing out, church? How would the world begin to open their ear to us and say, okay, we're seeing that the way that they're living is having a difference, having an impact. Now I'm interested. The Bible says that the world will know where, they're, where his disciples when they see our love for one another. This is why I'm talking about this walking in the way of love before we dive into the rest. Because the rest is Paul getting ready to pull out the flashlight. But he wants you to know before he grabs the flashlight and starts showing you things that are destructive for your life, things that we need to not have as part of our lifestyle, he wants you to understand that he's coming from this idea of love into the concept so take a look at verse 3. He says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, uh, obscenity foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. So there's Paul pulling out the flashlight. He's saying, let's walk in the way of love. Number one, if we want to love, we've got to get sinful habits out of our life. Because sinful habits are going to contaminate our spirit. And it's going to cause us to be in bondage. And if we're in bondage, it's going to prohibit us from walking in the way of love. So this passage isn't about a list of things that we are to beat each other up about. It's about, uh, it's about how do we effectively walk in love. The first thing we have to do is begin to remove the contamination from our life. Remove the things that dilute God's love so that we can begin to walk in fully. You can see in your bulletin, holy living and thankful speech must replace pleasure, spe uh, <laughs> pleasure seeking and disobedience. So Paul is saying, here's some ways that you can begin to 
immediately walk in love. Start, instead of speaking with filth, speaking things that put people down, speaking curses, speaking things that have no relevance or value, begin to give thanks. Begin to let your communication be uh, woven together with a grateful spirit. Where when people hear you talk, they hear humility. They hear someone who is grateful for everything that God has given you. But whenever we lose thankfulness and gratefulness, we begin to curse others. We begin to complain. We begin to grumble. Right? So Paul says, hey, if you want the antidote to filthy speech, to words that don't edify, Begin to have a thankful heart. I, I promise you, thankfulness will cure so many things in your life. How about that person that hurt you? What if you, instead of grumbling about what they did to you, what if you started thanking God for that? What if you said, God, thank you for sending that person into my life? Because although they hurt me, I learned how to draw closer to you. Although they hurt me, I learned how to turn to you with what they did and let vengeance be the Lord's. Thank you, God, for letting that person put me through what they put me through because as a result, it made me learn to forgive. And I was able to extract a tool from that scenario that I'll be able to use in every scenario moving forward. Thank you, God. David said, God prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runs over. Thank you, Lord. My cup runs over. Thankful speech. Thankful heart. And we have to begin to look at when Paul lists these different behavior patterns in this passage, all of them have one thing in common. Pleasure seeking. It's what philosophers call hedonism. Anybody's ever heard that before? It's essentially a mentality that says, I can be fulfilled if I find pleasure. And, and Roger spoke about it, I think it was either last week or the week before, he, he spoke out with a verse that talks about having a continual lust for more, but never really, never really finding that satisfaction. That's the pleasure-seeking mentality that Paul is saying, hey, if you want to walk in love, you got to get this out of your life. And it's so practical for a marriage context, but it's also practical for every other context. What if you're a pleasure seeker in your marriage, where your spouse just becomes something that God has given you to make you happy? How long is that going to last? How long are you going to uh, make withdrawals from the bank until you overdrive? This is why we shouldn't bring a pleasure-seeking mentality into our marriage. We have to bring the way of love. That God brought this person into my life for me to bless them, not for me to expect them to make me fulfilled. And if both, uh, both partners of the marriage take upon that attitude, wow, how blessed and satisfied you would be. But it's the upside-down kingdom of Jesus where in order to be blessed, we have to become lower. We stop seeking the higher things. Stop seeking the pleasure and the, 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 the fleshly, uh, you know, the things that appeal to our flesh and start just seeking to serve. If we want to be servants of Christ and we're married, we have to become servants of Christ in our marriage before we become servants of Christ in the church. Because we can't become effective in the church if we don't have our own home in order. That doesn't mean perfection, but that means acknowledging how important that is and daily gauging your improvement and asking God to grow you in that area. Think of pleasure seeking in terms of greed, as Paul talked about it, and how destructive that has been for people. Whereas, 
Those who, instead of seeking pleasure, just seek Christ, they are immediately walking in a state of peace and wholeness and grace. But the person seeking money is never satisfied. The person seeking the things of this world finds out there's a new iPhone coming out next year. And they got an upgrade. Right? And it's never enough. But then when we just let Christ become our all in all, a smartphone is just icing on the cake. It's just a tool of it device I can use to communicate with people and maybe share the good news of Christ. All of a sudden, everything that we have is no longer something we're using to try to pleasure ourselves. It, they just simply become things that we have that we can use to advance the kingdom of God. So this is where Paul is saying, walk in the way of love by avoiding these things, because by avoiding these things, it changes your mind. It transforms your thinking. You stop thinking about what you can get out of life, and it becomes what can you contribute. This is what called, this is what it means to overcome darkness. Let's take a look at the next few verses, and then we'll be finishing up. Verse 8 says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, You are light in the Lord. <laughs> Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I want you to look at your bulletin that says, to be God's light... We must refuse to be swallowed by the darkness. So this is where Paul says, okay, here's how we walk in the way of love. Here are our behavior patterns we need to get out of our life. But now let me just get real with you. You got to get serious about this thing. Because if we are, we are light, he didn't just say you are of the light or you are someone who God is shining his light through. He says, you are light in the Lord. Have you ever thought of that? You, who live can do, are light in the Lord. So, out of your new identity, be that child of light that God has called you. So you could be having a new identity as light in the Lord. You, God defines you as His light in the world. Yet you can fail to operate as such. And this is where he says, since you have this new identity, you have to understand identity. It's not about trying to become light. It's that you are light, so be that. And here's how you do it. You're going to have to expose some darkness. You can't just see evil happening and say nothing about it. You can't just keep your mouth closed when something needs to be said. So Paul says, yeah, let's walk in love, let's have personal integrity, but you also have a responsibility to open your mouth. But it all comes from that first two verses. You can open your mouth in a very wrong way, in a, in a very un ineffective way. As I gave the example where you just straight up tear someone to shreds and tell them how horrible they are. That's not how God is calling us to be. He's telling us, don't avoid exposing darkness and speaking out when you need to. But when you do so, use wisdom and use grace. He says, let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. So the danger that we have in the church in this generation is, number one, we can become way too aggressive. We can become this force of just angry people 
that never really reveal God's love to the world. We're just talking about everything that's wrong all the time. Nobody wants to be around someone like that. Or we can become so passive that we never speak up when we need to, like the German Christians in the time of the Holocaust. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, not enough Christians in Germany, a 90% Christian nation at the time, spoke up against this evil that Hitler was doing. There were some. There was a remnant. Yet, they compromised. They kept their mouths shut when they should have spoken out. And church, it's time for us to speak out. We can't keep our mouth closed any longer as we see everything around us becoming the way it's becoming. But we don't want to just be another voice that people ignore. Because people have already heard the complainers and abundance on the talk show or whatever. Don't be that. Be a voice that speaks in the authority of the scripture. Not a voice that speaks in the authority of your political affiliation. Because really, at the end of the day, it holds no way. The word of God is the only thing that will never pass away. And if we speak from its authority, heaven stands behind every word we say. And if we speak with the, with the heart of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in the authority of Scripture, nothing can stop us, church. This is God's solution for overcoming the darkness of our age, in which we don't become the passive church, the Laodicean church, the church that tolerated Jezebel. We become the church that speaks up that wins disciples, that doesn't compromise truth, but always keeps the spirit and nature of Christ in the very middle of everything we do and say. I really think it's time for pastors to start calling their congregants to go review their Facebook pages. Go review your Twitter account. Go review... I'm, I'm not going to review it. I ain't got time. I already unfollow people all the time because I don't want to review their Facebook if you know what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm going to I don't follow them if you don't, of course. <laughs> but maybe we need to go and say, is this really right? Is this, this, this truth that I'm trying to convey on my feet, is it really right? Or is it just me putting aggravation out into the world? Think about that. I told y'all at the beginning of the service when we were talking about tithing how I'm a very pragmatic person. I really want to see results, and I try, to, I try to live in such a way, if I find out that I'm doing something isn't working, I try to change it and find something that is working. So this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, oh, right or wrong, we're talking about wise or foolish. Is it working or is it not? So let's take a look at our social media pages. I, I give you a challenge in addition to the time challenge. Or whatever platform you've been putting your opinion on. And ask yourself, hey, is this light? Or is this just me being aggravated? And really what I'm doing is just making people ignore me. Because people will just ignore you. If, if you're bothering, they'll just ignore you. Or are you becoming something that puts something out there that people say, wow, that thought had to come from God. Man, I want to I meditate. I want to dwell upon that. I want to chew on that and see how it can change my life. There's no perfection. You're talking to someone who's put aggravated stuff out on Facebook. It used to be a place that I felt like I could vent, and then I realized, wow, you can't vent, you know, in public and expect results. So I had to really change my way of approaching social media and asking myself, if those who are observing my life see me walking in the way of love, living in a way that makes them curious about how to do the same, and then I have an open door to speak into. Amen? Amen. And so, this is what we mean when we talk about overcoming darkness. We have to walk in love. We have to understand what will be destructive to our world and get serious about it. 
And we have to be willing to speak up when the time is right. It's okay to put something out into the public sphere that addresses an issue that needs to be addressed. But when we do it, let's, let's use wisdom. Let's articulate our thoughts in a way that's attractive, that makes people, you know, consider what we have to say. Rather than just running in there with a, with a, with a low, low barrels loaded and just, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing where it just repels me. So I'm praying for wisdom in my own life, but I'm also praying for wisdom in all of our lives. How, God, can we more practically become light to those around us? How can we be uncompromising as it regards the truth of your word, yet also maintain the authentic, loving nature of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit? Amen? Amen. So we want to invite you to, oh, actually I want to read this last scripture. John chapter 1 verse 5. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so if we do what we've talked about this morning effectively, we will be victorious. If we can learn to shine God's light in a way that is totally infused with the Holy Spirit and done with wisdom in mind, darkness can overcome. Darkness gets swallowed up by the light, not the other way around. This is why Paul said, if you're a child of light, you need to walk as a child. If you're light, then you need to walk as a child of light. You need to stop engaging in these dark behavior patterns. You need to stop engaging in compromise and passiveness. You need to start living righteously, walking in love, and speaking up to make a difference. Amen.